Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. Today, it's a showdown between Steel Sports Chronographs, flagships of their brand, the Rolex Daytona and the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch. Separated by miles of Swiss geography and design philosophy, these are two unarguable greats and icons of the industry. We'll start with the Rolex Daytona because alongside various Richard Mille RM11 variants and the Patek Fleet 5711 Nautilus, Few watches can compare to the sheer buzz surrounding this watch, and it's been non-stop since this model bowed at Baselworld 2016. Outwardly, the only difference between this and the 2000 in-house caliber Daytona is the addition of the ceramic bezel, but it does transform the look of the watch. So much power, grace, and at 40 millimeters, a fit for any wrist. You can see this one on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist is easy to wear, backing off a little bit. You can really see the watch in proportion is suitable for wrists as small as 14 centimeters in circumference, and I've seen even smaller wear the watch successfully. It's not thick at 12.4 millimeters with a sloped case flank. It will fit underneath any cuff, and in that respect, it's probably the better and more natural match for a dress sleeve than the Omega. Lug to lug, the watch measures a very wearable 47 millimeters, and it's only 51.2 millimeters if you include the solid end links. So all over, this is one wearable watch. 21 millimeters between the lugs, but you're unlikely to accessorize this one with a strap. That's more the Omega's territory. Now the bracelet is a fantastic piece. First, you can see it's a true sports style oyster clasp with both the clamshell system and the beak and hook lock. It's actually a double lock. See, there is a, a beak and a hook inside. So. You hear it click shut, you can't pull it open, even with the clamshell open. That's how secure it is. It's a double lock. Now internally, you have a few different anchoring points. You have three different anchoring points you can access to change the stationing of the bracelet inside the clasp. You also have individual removable links fixed by screws and the Rolex 5mm Easy Link system, which is the equivalent of adding or removing one sizable link. So you've got that tool-free adjustment capability as well. The clasp is very secure, and as you can see, a premium piece polished on the inside and double finished externally with a little kerf to dig in your fingernail. The case band is graceful and fluid. This is not the super case you see on the GMTs, the Sea Dwellers, Submariners, and Explorer 2s. It's tapered and handsome, a traditional look that owes more to Rolex dress watch heritage, the date justs, and the day dates than any of the modern sports timepieces. Sheer guards, and as you can see, a trip lock crown. Despite the 100 meter water resistance, it uses the burlier trip lock rather than the twin lock. I have a feeling this watch's water resistance is underrated. Screw down crowns, as well as screw down pushers. The change for 2016 that created the fever pitch of excitement around this watch was the addition of a Cerachrom ceramic bezel. It has platinum fill to create the calibrations, the units, as well as the marks. And you can see that it does help to shield the watch from scratches. It also extends the dial, though a white dial version is available. The black in the black looks like a bigger watch because dial flows seamlessly into bezel. Sapphire crystal, another material mark of distinction versus the Omega. The dial is a black lacquer with metallic circular grained races for the registers and white gold applique indices Rolex coronet and hands. You can see the splash of red at 6 o'clock Rolex Daytona and the counterweighted chronograph seconds hand. Inside caliber 4130, 44 joules, automatic winding, 3-day power reserve, vertical clutch column wheel chronograph. It does feature a COSC chronometer certification and stop seconds plus a 4 hertz beat rate. Why does that matter? Because all of these are features the Omega lacks and critically it's an automatic. Now, the Moon Watch. Jumping back to a watch that has changed precious little since 1968. This is the latest variant of the Omega Speedmaster Professional. You'll see the reference in the box, so I'm not going to bore you with Omega's incomprehensible model numbers, but this is the latest and the greatest in a family that has changed little because NASA likes it that way. Of course, variants of this with the 321 flew to the moon, and the 1861 and 861 calibers that preceded it, the moon watch calibers officially have flown in all U.S. spacecraft since the Apollo program, as well as many of other nations as well. Now, the watch is 42 millimeters in diameter and 14.3 millimeters thick, and you can see right off the bat it is much thicker than the Daytona. Plus, there's the particular profile of that bezel. It's cantilevered outward, and it will hang up on a super tight cuff. So you can wear this one with a jacket, but it's not necessarily your choice for the tightest of dress sleeves. 
thermoplastic crystal. Omega calls it hesalite. NASA likes it because it's easy to crack but hard to shatter, so you don't have free-floating mass and broken matter in space. But it does create that wonderful off-axis vintage distortion. In a lot of respects, this is like a Jurassic watch, a modern production version of a vintage watch with a warranty. Lug to lug, the watch measures a wearable but beefy 48.5 millimeters, and if you include the solid end links of the bracelet, again, quite beefy, 54 millimeters across the wrist, 42 in diameter. It is a bigger watch in every dimension than the Rolex. The bracelet, and again, we're talking latest spec, uses staggered link alignment, staggered link size, and differential link polish to break up the mass of metal. You can see oval cross sections. It is quite different in profile from the Rolex Oyster. No one will ever accuse Omega of ripping off Rolex, though these are both three link designs. The difference is night and day. I would even go so far as to say the Omega bracelet looks like it would be more suitable for dress attire. It feels halfway between a sports bracelet and a dress bracelet in style. Underneath, big gaps to vent the wrist, avoid pinching skin or pulling hair. The clasp is a solid piece, machined from a solid ingot of steel, and you have twin trigger release, which is probably a little bit more convenient than the clamshell of the Rolex, but you don't have nearly the same adjustability inside. You have two different anchoring points, and that's it. Then you have removable links fixed by screws. Jumping back to the case, I call this a vintage watch produced new, and it really is that. As you can see, almost nothing has changed from the first Speedmaster Professionals in late 65, early 66. You see the lyre-shaped case with the polished and flared bevel. You see the thin and satin-finished mid-case. That's one of the trademarks of mid-century watch design, a very thin mid-case, even when the watch itself is chunky, and this retains those lines. You'll also note that the watch does feature the shear guards for crown as well as pushers that were officially the beginning of the professional line prior. There'd been an unbeveled case with a symmetrical left-right and then the shear guards arrived at NASA's insistence. You can see the tachymeter is calibrated for somewhat higher speeds than the Rolex, which is more of a motorsports chronograph, this one more aerospace, and it is an aluminum anodized insert, so it doesn't have the re resilience of the Rolex ceramic. You also have that hesalite crystal, which scratches easily, but again is very difficult to shatter. The dial is simple, high contrast, white on black print, sunken registers, you have no date on this watch either, and the contrast is higher even as the dial quality is somewhat lower, printed rather than applique features. Underneath the case back, manual wind, Omega Caliber 1861, 48 hour power reserve, 21 six beat rate. Rather than vertical clutch and column wheel with the Rolex, this is cam and lateral clutch. The payoff being it's almost indestructible, able to withstand a temporary 5,000 Gs. 50 meters water resistant, push down crown. This one probably isn't one for swimming, though I know that Swatch says you can get away with it. Nevertheless, the Rolex is the more natural companion for splish and splash. Of course, there is no hacking seconds function, and this one is a three hertz chronograph, so a bit less sophisticated, but probably also a bit tougher at the limit. Now let's go over the advantages of each watch. Okay, first, the Rolex. Let me be honest about what doesn't change from watch to watch. Both of these have no date. Both of these have five-year warranties, so both of these companies are going to take care of you if you buy new. They're also great buys pre-owned because you can get the majority of that half-decade warranty. So the Rolex, what, what does it have going for it? Well, prestige and status, cachet. I don't buy my watches on that basis, but that is a legitimate reason for buying a luxury good, and a lot of folks do identify with that, so it needs to be mentioned. This is a watch that sells new for $12,400 and sells pre-owned for between $22,000 and $24,000. So on that basis, right now, for value retention, not only is this watch a store of value, it's almost an investment. For now, I don't know if that holds up long term. I suspect if you buy this watch at list, it will never be worth less than that. Whereas the Omega sells new for $5,250, pre owned for $3,500 to $4,000. Now, let's talk about water resistance screw down crowns, trip lock crowns, screw down pushers. This is a 100 meter watch and a believable 100 meters. I would not swim with the push down crown, push down chronograph actuator, 50 meter water resistant Omega. So if you're gonna get wet, this is your all around sports watch. Moreover, clasp flexibility. Between the three different stationing points, and the EasyLink system, you have far more adjustability built into this clasp to size your watch on the fly than you have with the Omega. Also worth mentioning, in the real world, i.e. not NASA flight conditions, give me a sapphire crystal, please, for its scratch resistance, and give me a ceramic bezel for the same reason. This watch is simply better able to cushion the blows, the scratches, and scuffs that befall watches in everyday use. It's going to look new longer. 
I'll also mention that the watch has tech over the Omega in every respect. First, precision. Rolex makes a promise. Plus two, minus two, or better. Omega makes no such attestation. You want to talk tech in general? The flexibility of automatic winding rather than manual. A three-day power reserve versus two days. You have a vertical clutch column wheel chronograph, so you can leave the chronograph running here with no worry about wear and tear of the mechanism. And thanks to the column wheel, it is quite crisp. I'm going to say, though, that the Omega runs it close in that regard. Omega's cam system is very sharp. But overall, for tech refinement, it's got to be this one. Add the Parachrome Blue anti-magnetic hairspring, the 4 hertz beat rate versus the 3 hertz of the Omega, and the fact that this one does feature stop seconds or hacking. This is simply the more sophisticated watch in every respect. Now, I don't mean to talk down the ancient aviator. This watch has got plenty going on, starting with the fact that pre-owned, you can get six and a half of these for the price of one secondary market Daytona. Whether purchased new or pre-owned, the value proposition does side with Omega. I'll also mention legibility. Though the dial is not quite of the same quality as the lacquered white gold index Rolex, here the print, white on black, is no nonsense. The matte finish, anti-reflective, and it wins the loom shot, which you'll see. So day or night, this one's easier to read. I'll also mention, and this is critical, that the watch does feature a loomed seconds hand, so at night you can use at least the seconds component of the chronograph. I'll also mention that the watch is a more natural match for the strap. There have been generations of straps and bracelets on this exact same case, and over the years, many have looked natural. Leather. Do you want leather in gaiter? Do you want calf? Do you want textile? Do you want rubber? Anything works on this watch. Go NATO. It's natural. This is the one to pair with the strap if you wish to. I'll mention that the peerless history of actual spaceflight is one that the Rolex, even with its Daytona reputation and its motorsports side story, it's quite simply just a gift at a racetrack. This actually flew and flies to this day with NASA. The Rolex has gravitas. This has a real foothold in aviation history and aerospace history. It's a legend. So this watch, also a wonderful manual wind watch that's soulful. You have to interact with this watch at least every other day. And that's a piece of the vintage watch experience that lives on in this chronograph. And the Daytona has long since lost that user interaction. I'll also mention that at the limit, even though the Daytona does feature a full bridge and a free sprung balance, this movement is tougher. And that's been borne out in real world testing to destruction by NASA. I'll also mention that it's just easier to use. Without the screw down chronograph pushers, they're always accessible and always usable. And in fact, it's more practical for trackside use than the Daytona. That's why the old reference 60 62-62 and 62-64 existed, because even after the advent of the screw-down Crown Daytona, there were still folks in motorsports applications, in motorsports industries, who could use a watch with conventional non-screw pushers. When you need to actuate that chronograph without first prepping your watch, a non-screw is the easy option and the obvious choice. So perhaps in the Rolex's own field of comp competence, motorsports, the Omega still has a leg up and they both have tachymeter bezels. I'm going to pick the Rolex. Why? Because I'm more of a race car fan and an auto racing fan than an aerospace fan. For me, this watch has formidable reputation, not quite to the level of legend. No, it doesn't have that real toehold in history that the Omega has, but it's a more elegant watch, a more advanced watch. On my wrist, I think it looks more potent, punchy, and emotionally compelling. This one tugs at my heartstrings, even as the movement and the superior materials employed appeal to my intellect. So I'm a Daytona guy. Between the Battle of Florida, Cape Canaveral versus Daytona International Speedway, give me the Speedway 10 times out of 10. You guys tell me in the comments below which one you choose. Moonwatch versus Daytona. That one goes to the Moonwatch. Last licks taken by the Omega.